Hi, Andrew Penn, back again to talk about bipolar spectrum diagnosis. In our last talk, we, we discussed how bipolar disorder really should be thought of as a spectrum disorder, ranging from unipolar depression, minimally recurrent, to bipolar disorder, highly recurrent. And we're gonna talk about a way of using a systematic approach to assess for that. And we'll also talk about some diagnoses which can mimic bipolar disorder. So the, I'm gonna teach you the STEP-BD approach. STEP-BD was a large National Institutes of Mental Health study in the early 2000s, looking at how to better diagnose and treat bipolar disorder. And we're gonna talk about how to differentiate it from some of the most common uh, conditions where it, with which it has overlap, which is PTSD and borderline personality disorder, and also some medical diagnoses and comorbidities that go along with bipolar disorder. So here's the concept of a bipolar spectrum laid out graphically. So again, the most convincing is bipolar one, people that have highly recurrent manic episodes and depressive episodes. And then bipolar two, Bipolar NOS, NOS is now often referred to as unspecified in DSM-5, and then these less convincing bipolar uh, presentations, which may look like just recurrent major depression. So this is what we might consider, uh, what might have historically been considered ma manic depressive illness, that anybody who has recurrent mood episodes, regardless of if they are uh, depressive or manic in nature, would be considered on that spectrum. So we'll talk about how to break this down. Now you'll see those numbers there. Uh, these are not psychometrically validated numbers. So I wouldn't put this in your, your chart notes, for example, but it kind of gives you a ballpark idea if you use this system of uh, thinking about how bipolar somebody might be. So thinking of that in relative degrees. I want to introduce you to one of my old patients. She was a 30-year-old woman who was training to become a therapist. And she came to me with an unusual complaint at the time because bipolar disorder was not as well known in the general public. She said, I think I might have bipolar disorder. So I said, well, let's explore that. And she said her history uh, in recent months had been to have this kind of chronic low mood and loss of interest in, and pleasure in things uh, mixed with some anxiety, some insomnia, and when she didn't sleep well, she was tired. And the pattern, which uh, you'll start to see is really important, was that she had a couple of weeks of depression that would start and end with no clear precipitant. And that's important because that helps us to differentiate a mood episode which may be coming more from the person's biology compared to somebody's mood episode that's coming more from their circumstances in their life. Um, and at the time I saw her, she was doing pretty well. Her history, which is also very important, it was that she had depression for the first time at age 13. It was untreated, went away on its own. She had another episode of depression at age 21 for which she did have some antidepressant treatment. And since then, she'd sort of had this on again, off again, dysthymia or low mood. She did have um, a trauma at the age of 25 in the form of a date rape. Um, pertinent negatives here, uh, no substance abuse, no suicidal ideation, no psychosis. She was already in treatment. Um, of concern here, her mother had schizophrenia, her father had bipolar disorder. So a lot of family loading here. And she's apprehensive around medication. So when I said, what would you like to do? She said, I'd really like to see if I can get my sleep better. So I offered her some trazodone, which is pretty common treatment. She said it, it didn't help her very much, so we stopped that. And I started to think that depression was maybe more pertinent here than anything. So I offered some mirtazapine because it also has that capacity for helping sleep. And it did help, it helped with her mood as well, but only for about two months. And then the benefit dropped off uh, quite quickly and she became depressed again. She said, you know, I remember when I was being treated when I was 21, uh, I had a, a course of Paxil, which seemed to help. And so I gave her some of that and at a very low dose, she uh, said she started to have increased energy and uh, decreased need for sleep and racing thoughts that had a real kind of negative emotional tone, a dysphoric tone. And she said, you know, I think this is what happened to me before. And so I, at this point, I started thinking more about bipolarity. So I offered Lamotrigine or Lamictal. She got a rash. We'll talk more about uh, what that rash probably was when we get to the pharmacology module. Uh, so I stopped it. And I put her on lithium, which worked very well for her. She still has some, had some uh, depressive episodes, but they're nowhere near as intense as they once were. So let's use this framework to break down these different areas of the presentation. And the first thing we look at is the age of onset. Now, a, a footnote here, each of these five categories can score up to 20 points. So you'll see I've layered this out in the most convincing 
uh, characteristics of each of these categories. And the point of this exercise is not to have you remember each of these specific um, criteria because it's too much to remember. You can always use these notes uh, from these slides to, if you want to go back over one of your patients with a fine tooth comb. But what I really want you to take away from this is sort of the big picture, which is which of these five areas is most convincing for a bipolar disorder? And those are the ones that score 20 points. The fewer points that you get, the less likely it is to be a bipolar disorder. So people that have classic bipolar one typically begin to manifest that between the age of 15 and 19 years old. So usually high school years, and that gets us 20 points. If your first episode, and by first episode, I mean it could be depression or it could be mania, if that occurs but before the age of 15 or in your young adult years of 20 to 30, that uh, would also be suspicious for bipolar disorder in this particular category. The older you get, the, the, the bad news, you get more gray hair. The good news is if you have a first episode of a mood disorder, the less likely it is to be a bipolar disorder. Then we look at what does the characteristic, what are the characteristics of the episode, of the mood episode? So people that get full-blown mania, by that I mean they're grandiose, they're euphoric, they're going for days without sleep, that's most convincing of bipolar one, and that's why this gets that full 20 points here. People that have more of a mixed presentation, so that thing where they're sort of have depressed uh, mood episodes but have a lot of energy in their mania, that is also suspicious for bipolar disorder, but not quite the slam dunk. And this is starts to capture people who are probably going to be in that bipolar 2 category of assigning 10 points to people that have clear hypomania or the people who kick into mania with antidepressants. And then again, the lower down we get, the murkier it is, and the fewer points this scores. Uh, and this is a nod to people that may have that recurrent depression but that have no history of mania whatsoever. It gives us only two points. And then we look at the course of the illness. So people that have bipolar one, interestingly, they can get very ill, but they often recover fully, especially with mood stabilizers. So it's not uncommon to see somebody who is in the hospital with a full episode of mania, and then a week later, they're doing much better. And that's quite impressive to watch. It's, it's, it's a significant contrast. And there are some people who have, uh, they take longer to get better or they stay a little bit unwell in between episodes. And that is also suspicious for bipolar disorder, but not quite the slam dunk that the full recovery would indicate. And then because psychotic features during mood episodes, even if it's during a depressive episode, can be associated with bipolar disorder, that's why this is given 10 points. And substance abuse or legal problems are considered proxies. So because substance abuse is quite common with bipolar disorder, uh, the presence of it alone is considered to score 10 points here if nothing else qualifies at a higher point value. And then again, looking at this recurrent major depression. So these are people who are often diagnosed as being, having, having treatment resistant depression uh, when they may in fact actually have a bipolar spectrum disorder. Hyperthymic temperament is really just kind of a, a high energy, less need for sleep, fast thinking, fast moving, kind of uh, baseline setting. It's not uh, anywhere near the full uh, quality of mania, but this is something that, that is sort of innate in, in some people. Uh, you see this a lot in San Francisco, a lot in Silicon Valley in certain industries where people just have this kind of relentless drive and, they're, and that's just sort of their, their nature. And that's uh, considered to be a hyperthymic temperament. Not, again, not a bipolar condition, but uh, it, it, if there were other symptoms present, we might consider bipolarity as a, as a diagnosis. So how do they respond to treatment when they're given medication? So again, like I said, people who uh, have bipolar one, when they're given a mood stabilizer, often will get better quite uh, drastically. Uh, it's, it's quite dramatically, I should say. It's, it's impressive uh, how quickly they can get better. Other people take a bit longer to get better. They take uh, two or three months to fully recover, or people that get manic when given an antidepressant. People that get worse when you give them an antidepressant should be uh, reevaluated, and you should consider the possibility that what we're seeing is a mixed state and that we may have missed a bipolar diagnosis. And then again, here's your treatment resistant depression category. So people that have had mania, sorry, have had depression, but that's not responded to at least three antidepressants. And then finally, these are the people that call you three days after starting an antidepressant and tell you how much better they're feeling. Well, it's likely to be a placebo response, which is fine. 
um, it's also possible that this is a person who is starting to get manic. So you would want to keep an eye on that person, but it's not certainly not a super convincing characteristic of a response to treatment that's associated with bipolar. Then really importantly, we want to look at family history. So we look at uh, first degree relatives. So that's mom, dad, brother, or sister, and anybody of those who has documented bipolar disorder, uh, that increases the likelihood that our patient might have bipolar disorder. This is a nod to families that have a lot of recurrent major depression in the family. Uh, could, that could potentially be uh, underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed bipolar disorder. And then again, these are proxy measures. So sometimes you'll see families that are full of substance abuse and that alone, of course, does not, uh, is not convincing. Uh, but it is possible because substance abuse is so comorbid with bipolar disorder that what was actually happening was that many of those folks had bipolar disorder. And then again, here a nod to that recurrent major depression in the family history. So let's go back and use this uh, understanding, this framework, to break down the case study I shared with you earlier. So let's take a look at the pattern of her illness. And that's that she's had uh, recurrent major depression with at least three distinct episodes. And her history is that she had her first episode at 13. So that gives us 15 points here. So now we're running a total of 20. And we look at that family history again. Mom has schizophrenia, father has bipolar disorder. So we've got a family relative, a first degree family relative with documented bipolar disorder. So that scores the full 20 points in that category. Then we look at how she responded to medications. Paroxetine, an antidepressant, uh, made her somewhat hypomanic. So that scores five points here. And then when given a mood stabilizer in the form of lithium, she did very well. Took her a little while, but she did quite well. So when we add that all up, we get to 60 out of 100. Now 60 out of 100, as you see here in the sort of ballparking measure, puts us right in the middle of the bipolar spectrum, which is really about where she sits. She's in that sort of un, um, the sort of uh, not otherwise specified, um, undefined bipolar disorder. Uh, she's certainly not bipolar one, but she has enough characteristics here. And she, and at the end of the day, what matters is that she responded well to the treatment that she was given, which was a mood stabilizer, and it helped her a lot more than an antidepressant seemed to be helping her. Now, when we think about other comorbidities, especially when we're much further down on this bipolarity index scale, we want to not only consider recurrent major depression, but we also want to consider the person's personality style or even a personality disorder and the possibility of the presence of trauma, particularly complex trauma. So let's take a look at that differential. So we've gone over bipolar disorder. I think you're familiar with that at this point. The key thing I want to point out here is that it's an episodic course. So this is kind of a waxing and waning condition. Now, people with borderline personality disorder, we conceptualize this more through a sort of psychodynamic or self-psychology kind of framework where this has much more to do with the person's relationship, not only with other people, but with their own inner world and that sort of unstable sense of self and the ensuing problems that come in relationships. Now, people with borderline personality they, disorder, they can have this sort of waxing and waning course, but it tends to be more of a chronic course than bipolar disorder, which can have pretty clear, yes, this is a bipolar episode. No, there is not a bipolar episode present. With people with borderline personality disorder, it, it tends to be uh, more, more chronic. Now, people with trauma, uh, now your classic understanding of, of PTSD with a criterion A event where the person was exposed to a life-threatening situation, um, that is often characterized by, of course, as you know, hypervigilance, avoiding triggers of the trauma, uh, having re-experiencing events in the form of nightmares or flashbacks, and then a sort of a numbing that can occur. Now, what we're talking about here is, is often complex trauma, and complex trauma, while not defined in the DSM, is thought to be the result of more um, unstable early childhood experiences, usually with a caregiver who is unpredictable, and that often creates a lot of these interpersonal problems. But you can see that there's a lot of overlap between these three conditions uh, with regards to impulsivity and irritability, with these transient mood shifts that can control, that can uh, involve loss of anger control, even paranoia, and suicidal behavior, unfortunately, is problematic in all of these conditions. So it's also important to remember that just because you have one of these doesn't mean you can't have the other. 
So there is often a lot of overlap here. As one of my teachers told me, you know, remember a dog can have t ticks and fleas. Uh, just because you've got one doesn't mean you don't have the other. So this requires very careful diagnosis. Now the problem with us misdiagnosing this is when we have a prescription pad, we tend to go looking, it's like a hammer, and we tend to go looking for nails. And the problem is, is we often, um, we often define a nail as this bipolar two diagnosis. And unsolicited opinion, I think bipolar two is probably the murkiest diagnosis in the entire DSM. And I think often what we call bipolar two is this complex PTSD or disorders of extreme uh, stress not otherwise specified is another term that's sometimes used, or this borderline personality structure. And these folks often have a, a great difficulty tolerating emotional distress. And so what do we do? We take our hammer out and we throw a lot of meds at it. We usually use uh, multiple medications, which often are not terribly effective. And so what really this is like is sort of like trying to drive a nail, uh, drive a screw with a nail. And while you can do it, uh, it's not recommended and it's kind of ugly. And so what you really need, you need a screwdriver. And the screwdriver in this case is using evidence-based psychotherapy for PTSD, targeting specific symptoms. So if the person has real problems with insomnia, go ahead and treat that. If they have clear depression, go ahead and treat that. But a lot of times what you're actually doing is, is de-prescribing. You're getting rid of medications that are, have not really helped them, but have been uh, piled on over the course of their, their condition. And a lot of people are afraid to talk to people with, uh, about having a borderline personality structure. And that's too bad because honestly, most patients I've talked to have never heard the term. Uh, and what ends up happening is we think this is a bad thing because we treat it like a bad thing. Uh, we use this as a pejorative in our, in our break rooms and in rounds. We talk about people being borderlines. And you know, the reality I find is a lot of people who get diagnosed or get considered to be borderline uh, in, in inpatient settings often have other personality uh, disorders such as uh, dependent or the unfortunately term histrionic, uh, which is a very emotionally uh, expressive uh, kind of personality disorder. A lot of sort of distress intolerance gets embedded into there. So even the term borderline is used inaccurately a lot of the time, but when, we, when it is there, I believe we should diagnose it uh, because otherwise what ends up happening is we treat it with mood stabilizers, which doesn't usually work very well. The person doesn't get referred to something like DBT and that's a real loss. Now, how should we do this? Well, first of all, realize that you may be carrying around a lot of biases around that diagnosis uh, because you know a lot of times folks with borderline personality disorder, if you've worked in the hospital, are challenging. Um, and a lot of times we have a lot of negative countertransference towards them. So it's important never to diagnose when you are upset uh, diagnose when the iron is cold. And when you, uh, if you're going to diagnose somebody with this condition, what you need to do is, if you just tell somebody you have borderline personality disorder, that's really meaningless. Most people will say borderline of what? Um, so I break it down. I say, you know, it sounds like um, in your relationships, which is usually where it shows up, um, when you get upset, it's often because you feel like the person's going to leave or that they're not available to you. And when you get in that upset state, you can't turn off your upset. So you resort to things like cutting on yourself or saying you're going to uh, uh, kill yourself in order to manage that distress. And that creates a lot of problems for you. And usually at that point, the patient's like, oh, you know me. How do you know this so well? Okay. So I will use that as a segue towards uh, DBT. So I'll say, you know, the good news is we have a treatment for this. Um, it doesn't come in the form of a pill. It's a type of therapy which helps people develop more, dis more tolerance for distress, more ability to regulate their emotions, and then to put it into play with, uh, in their relationships. So again, you can't diagnose this, any of these things from a snapshot. Somebody walking into my office with bipolar depression is going to look like they just have plain old depression unless I take the long view. Somebody who comes in uh, just upset with their partner may have borderline personality disorder, but unless I ask about the last three or four relationships they were in, I won't see the pattern. So again, psychiatry is pattern recognition and psychi psychiatric diagnosis is never based on one symptom alone. If you only have a few minutes to screen for bipolar disorder, I think these are the highest yield questions. I ask about changes in sleep and activity because frankly, nobody remembers their mood. I don't remember what kind of mood I was in last week, let alone last year. And so I ask about specific behaviors. I say, were there times when you needed less energy, but you, had, uh, but you didn't need to sleep as much? 
And what was happening during that time? Were you more sped up? Were you more irritable? That's often quite helpful for identifying uh, cases where you need to ask more questions. And then get the family in the room. Uh, ask them about it because a lot of times patients will will forget certain episodes, but their spouses won't. And so don't don't do this behind people's back. Invite them into the next session. Have an open conversation where you're asking about things like their sleep patterns and behaviors that were out of the ordinary, like spending a lot of money or taking a lot of risks. Anxiety is a very common co-traveler with bipolar disorder, and it's important to treat both. A lot of times if you get the mood stabilized, the anxiety will drop off considerably, but you can see here there's high comorbidity between anxiety and bipolar disorder. Also substance abuse, bipolar one is the most highly comorbid with substance abuse of all the DSM, uh, what we used to call access one diagnoses. And so uh, you really want, you're often gonna end up treating both. And again, when people's mood is stabilized, a lot of times they're not trying to regulate their energy and their mood with substances so much. So sometimes you can see an improvement in both areas with mood stabilization. Now there are a few medical conditions which can look like bipolar disorder. Probably the most uh, common is an intoxication state, which usually is going to uh, get better as the drug wears off. So stimulants of course can create a manic kind of presentation. And then steroids are notorious for the, doing this, corticosteroids. Um, Prednisone makes most people feel really sped up and have difficulty with sleep. Um, and of course, interferon can cause depressive-like symptoms. Somebody who has hyperthyroidism can look like they are manic, as uh, obviously somebody with hypothyroidism can look depressed. And sometimes delirium can have a manic kind of quality to it as well. But those are less common. I would call those zebras rather than the horses, which usually comprise bipolar diagnoses. So in, in summary, I want you to think of this as not as a, a single yes or no category, but rather as a spectrum from people who are definitely bipolar to people who are very unlikely to be bipolar. And I want you to think about ruling out some of these uh, comorbidities, or at least keeping a, an open mind about the possible comorbidities of things like complex trauma and borderline personality disorder. And also uh, bearing in mind that many people with bipolar disorder have problems with substance abuse and anxiety as well. I thank you for your attention.